Good morning and welcome to worship with South Frankfurt Presbyterian Church. I'm Marion Taylor and it's just delightful to see everyone here today. Uh, I've got just a few announcements before we uh, start worship in earnest. Um, one is as we try to keep up with the, the various edicts about masks and so on, um, it seems that we've been given permission to not wear masks if we don't want to wear them, and, uh, but they're still recommended for anyone who wants extra protection. So the, the session had decided as, as our policy that we would do what the official recommendations are, and my understanding is that that's the official recommendation now. So uh, if you want that extra measure of protection, by all means, wear a mask. Uh, but if you're fully vaccinated, the, the wisdom out there is you no longer have to wear one in order to be protected. Um, Jason Shaw uh, texted me to let me know the youth successfully arrived at Montreat. So, uh, yay, uh, I know. I just, oh, every year I just pray for a safe arrival and safe return, uh, but also for a great week. So keep them also in your prayers. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful adult vacation Bible school again this year. And I think probably our all-time favorite may be Dr. Jerry Sumney. Uh, he's going to be teaching about the Gospel of Mark. And uh, that's uh, evenings, June 21st through 24th, uh, Monday through Thursday of that week. And you do need to register because this is going to be taught on Zoom. So you need to be uh, sent the link for the four sessions. Um, and it's very easy to do. You can call the church office and Cindy Susan can email you the registration link that you need. And I think a, uh, registration has gone up quite a bit since we emailed that out. Um, we are soon to start a search for a new music director. And uh, Mary Elizabeth Stivers is uh, spearheading that effort. Uh, so it, I don't think it's too early to start networking. If you know about wonderful church musicians who might be interested and available. So just let Mary Elizabeth know if you've got a lead for us. Um, uh, the market has sort of opened up for church musicians now. So there's, we're going to have, a, I think, a good bit of competition, but we'll keep praying for God to send us just the right person anyway. Uh, attendance registration. Our new system worked really well last week, so let's do it again this week so we don't have to pass the little red booklets around. When you see those little doodle pads in the back of the pew in front of you, we call those the piddling pads for Presbyterians, um, you just grab one, pull off the sheet, write your name on it, and leave it in the pew. And that way, um, usually by Wednesday, we'll come in here, pick them up, uh, we'll kind of have an idea where you sat in relation to whom. Um, and then, you know, for visitors, that gives me what I need to know to contact people and, and welcome them. Uh, so thank you for helping out with that. Was there anything else that you were hoping I would announce? I, sometimes I, I might slip up and miss something important that needed to be announced. If not, let's worship God. Let's stand for our call to worship. 
This is the day the Lord has made, a chance to be transformed. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Seeds spring up and fruit is harvested, ever constant yet always new. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. There is might in meekness and strength in humility. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Let the work of God's kingdom be our act of worship. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Please be seated. Jennifer Grisham is going to lead our children's time. Did we manage to get a mic on you yet? Would you, would you mind using this one then? Sorry about that. Just turn this on. for somebody tall. Good morning. I think we have some children that are out there. This is very different from us. We've been doing this on Zoom for a long time now, and so I'm glad to be in front of you, and hopefully soon we'll have the children in front of us. Today I'm going to talk to you all about things that you cannot see but that you know are there. And so I brought a pinwheel, and uh, you know with a pinwheel, if you put it outside, that the wind will blow it, and it'll turn. And so the wind is something that is there that you cannot see, but you know is there. Similarly, if I blow on the pinwheel, this worked at home, glad it did here, my breath, you cannot see, is there, but you know it's there. And there are other things like that. Music, you can hear, but you cannot see music. Also, we've been talking last, in the last few years, the last year, <laughs> seems like the last few years, about germs and viruses. And those are things that we know are there because there have been so many people that are sick, but we can't actually see those germs and we can't see those viruses. The Bible teaches us about confidence, for it says we walk by faith and not by sight. And so if you think about what the word confident means, it kind of has two definitions. The first is that it's a strong belief in something. And it also means that we're sure of ourselves and our abilities. And our belief in God is our faith. We believe in God because he loves us. We believe we cannot see God, but we know that he created us and he created love. Being confident is a really good thing. And sometimes we feel really confident if we do things that we think we're really good at. But sometimes we may feel unsure about those activities. At times when we are uncertain... We have confidence that God's love is always with us no matter where we are and what our circumstances may be. We don't have to see things to know that they are real. In fact, the best things that we may be, the things that we do not see, those invisible things that give us confidence to be who we are and to do good work. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, Thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. That we can be in this space together. That we can be in this space together. Thank you for giving us the confidence. Thank you for giving us the confidence. To believe in the things that we cannot see. To believe in the things that we cannot see. But know are there. But know are there. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and uh, what a great introduction to an act of confession where we believe in God's grace and forgiveness. Let's join now in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, in your presence we are humbled and we long for your help. We know we too often make snap judgments instead of consulting you. Forgive us. We even judge other people without getting to know them. Forgive us. We miss out on so much of the abundance of life you want us to have because we're in a rush or we've become jaded or something has happened to the eyes of faith we once had. <clears throat> Help us to reach out to you more often and more truly. We want to shed our unhelpful ways and embrace your life-giving ways. Help us, O oh Lord, for the sake of your plan for our lives and for this world. Amen. God is indeed compassionate and ever-present in our trials and troubles. 
So accept now with grateful hearts that God has removed these failings from you, removed them as far as east is from west through the gracious love of Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven. <clears throat> We'll sing now, um, How Lovely Lord, how, uh, which is number 402 in your hymnals. <clears throat> Our reading today is from 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, um, here, uh, we, we, when we talk about walking by faith and not by sight, uh, that's part of why the image of Jesus as the light of the world is so important to us. So now let's listen to our friend Lewis Washington sing Jesus, the Light of the World. the Lord. 
My favorite uh, professor in graduate school, I did a PhD in political science, and my favorite professor in that program was a political scientist named Sidney Verba. And I wasn't the only one who thought he was the greatest. Uh, when he died a couple of years ago, there was an article about him, and, and one of his fellow professors who'd known him the longest said this about him. He was always the adult in the room. A wonderful person, and he was a pioneer in the study of political participation by average citizens. What is it that, that encourages people to have the sense of efficacy to get involved in a democracy? But his, in some ways, his even greater contribution was to, um, to see how you could do a comparative study like that internationally. How do you do survey research and compare uh, apples and oranges across countries in the field of political participation. So at one point, he got a, a large grant for a cross-national study of political participation, and it included the country of Nigeria. So he went there for a month or two, and just about every day, uh, he had meetings with collaborators at one of Nigeria's big universities. As he hurried back and forth across the campus, he often came across a Nigerian gentleman who was sitting in traditional robes in the shade of a tree. And they would exchange pleasantries. Then one day, they had a real conversation. The man identified himself to Dr. Verba as the chief of a large people group in a large territory. And he said, I, he had a question. He said, I've heard that you're a very important man, but you do not appear to be very important at all. Here, important people can sit in the shade for hours and not rush to meetings and not work all day. Well, every culture has its idea of what to look for, right? To determine whether to listen or defer to a certain person. Pause for a moment to think of what flags you may have learned, what filters you have, what you look for. Maybe a corner office with windows, would that be a signal? A certain way of enunciating and of matching subjects and verbs. Signs of financial well-being, such as good teeth, clothes, car. Hopefully, maybe some sign of good character would be one of your filters for whether to listen to somebody or not. Well, the Apostle Paul had a situation similar to Dr. Verba's failure to look important to a Nigerian chief. Because the people in Corinth were culturally blinded to Paul's importance. They couldn't see it because Paul didn't fit the profile that they had for important people. He didn't have the signals that they were looking for. Oh, his writings were very impressive. Paul had mastered the rhetorical arts of his time, and he was respected for that. 
he had a huge vision about God's work in the world, and he was respected for that. But then he'd show up in person and things would go downhill. Well, first, he worked with his hands. He had a little tent-making business. Ooh, the Corinthians thought. He worked with his hands. Important people don't do that, much less spiritual leaders. And then just as bad, he preferred working this way to participating in the system of patronage in Corinth. Everyone there was caught up in patron-client relationships. It's how the gears of society meshed and turned. But Paul refused. He wanted to preserve the independence of his gospel message. But in the process, he'd insulted the patrons who had offered to sponsor him. Does this manual laborer think our money's no good? Add to all this that Paul was not physically impressive. And it seems that his voice went along with that puniness. His public speaking wasn't as powerful as his writing was. You may have met a famous author or two who struck you that way, and it, it is a letdown. Now compound all of this with the fact that there were competing spiritual leaders, even purported followers of Christ, who did fit the Corinthians' ideas of worth, and they were criticizing Paul. Enter Paul's famous saying, we walk by faith and not by sight. Paul took this opportunity of being discriminated against and dissed. He took this opportunity to tell the believers under his tutelage that they needed a better way of seeing. They needed a better way of looking at him. They needed a better way of looking at each other. And they needed a better way of looking at the cosmos and what God was up to. The question should no longer be, what does my culture teach me to see? But rather, what does biblical faith teach me to see? What does God see? What does God want me to see? What would please God? As Paul made his case for this new way of seeing, he had recourse to the strongest argument of all, the example of Jesus Christ. It was as if to say, if, if you think being puny and working with one's hands is an obstacle to giving someone your respect, then surely death on a Roman cross would be a bigger obstacle for you. Do you really think that a person who can tell you authentically about the Savior who died that way should first have to pass all of your culturally determined filters and tests? Well, that's a profound question and a profound point. And it's one that has the power to free us for participation in God's work, if we'll allow it. Throughout Paul's letters to the Corinthians, he's urging believers to be countercultural, not for the sake of being contrary, but for the sake of seeing and participating in God's work in the world. What could it look like here and now in our time and place to walk by faith and not by sight, putting aside the lenses that have been given to us and trying on God's prescription lenses. With God's lenses on, maybe people struggling at the lower end of our economy could start to look different to us. Lately, we've heard the view that people aren't applying for jobs because they're getting unemployment benefits or that they were. But the people I've known who live on the edge have been making conscientious choices to benefit their children. 
they need affordable childcare and they need housing that is affordable and safe so that there aren't drug dealers right outside the front door and they need health insurance for the son or daughter who needs medication. When the work world offers some prospect of helping them take care of those children, then they usually want to have the dignity of work like anyone else. Knowing such people personally has helped me take a more skeptical look at some of the lenses that are being offered to me through truisms. Well, what does this have to do with faith? Again, it, it has to do with believing that God is a force for life and love in every social class and in every setting. It has to do with believing that when the scriptures call us to generosity to people in need, it's, it's not out of an impossibly naive and ignorant posture, but out of God's own knowledge of people in need. Well, what might be another example of Paul's injunction to walk by faith and not by sight? His urging that we swap out the given lenses for the countercultural ones that are offered to us by God. I'll bet every one of you could make a list. You've had some handed down prejudice popped like a balloon at some point, and suddenly you saw differently. Maybe your prejudice wasn't against poor people, but against rich people. And then you got to know a wealthy person whose life is led by God's vision for the world. Maybe it was getting to know someone whose sexual orientation or identity is different. Maybe like Paul, you discovered just the freedom of living simply so that you can respond nimbly to God's call and not be tied down by financial entanglements. Living simply is countercultural too. Paul had a huge vision and it was not for people to be countercultural or iconoclastic just for the fun of it. It was so that the followers of Jesus Christ could be part of God's big plan for the cosmos. And a concrete manifestation of that big plan in Paul's mind was the offering that he'd urged congregations to collect to help those struggling believers in Jerusalem. That one act of generosity carried a meaning well beyond the relief that it would provide to the poor and the persecuted. It would mean that the Gentile world and the Jewish world were no longer divided. It meant that in Christ, God overcame and overcomes divisions that had separated people from time immemorial. It meant that we could be and must be part of God's work of reconciliation. So he needed to overcome their uh, way of looking at him in order to lead them to seeing the big picture of God's work through that offering that was so important, uh, representing as it did God's work for reconciliation in the world. The big picture can't be seen when we're still wearing our old lenses. The Corinthians couldn't see it unless they stopped being prejudiced against puny guys with squeaky voices. They couldn't see it unless they stopped being prejudiced against people who worked with their hands for a living. They couldn't see it unless they stopped fearing people they couldn't locate in socially in their patron-client system. And like the Corinthians, we too need a prophetic word from God's messengers to discover what lenses we need to set aside for the sake of God's work in the world. So let's pray for that help together now. Let's pray. O oh God, in whom we live and move and have our being, as we walk by way of faith, may we trust the way you've called us to, even when what we see for ourselves feels comfortable and secure. Open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts that we may follow you. Let us not pass by the seemingly small. What we see as meek 
you see as mighty. You know the potential of what we're tempted to write off. Help us to see greatness as you do. May we recognize your unseen work. When we overlook the stirring movement of your just presence, open our eyes to recognize you. And let us not miss our opportunity to join the good work. Move us beyond our own understanding and self-interest that we may be joyful collaborators. Open our hearts to transformation. You change old to new, small to great, and defeat to victory. We doubt it could be possible, and yet we know it's true. Transform us for our full potential so that we may use our time on earth to do what is pleasing to you and right by your people. Amen. Let's continue our prayers, uh, now extending our prayers beyond ourselves to the world that God loves. Let us pray. By your power, great God, our Lord Jesus, healed the sick and gave new hope to the hopeless. Though we cannot command or possess your power, we pray for those who want to be healed especially for those listed on our church prayer list. Mend their wounds, soothe fevered brows, and make broken people whole again. Help us to welcome every healing as a sign that though death is against us, you are for us and have promised renewed and risen life in Jesus Christ the Lord. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
As you go, may the seed planted here continue to grow. May the anointing of your life assure you that you are worthy. May you participate in a transformation greater than you could ever imagine. And may the love of God sustain you until we meet again. Amen. Join me now, if you will, in the spirit of prayer. O oh God, your written word has been passed along to us like a relay race run by scribes, monks, scholars, and all the faithful who have sought you in those pages. To honor them, we open our hearts now to your revelation of yourself and of your will for us. Amen. Our reading is from Psalm 139 verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 18. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! 
how vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. The word of the Lord. Warren's inspiring solo reinforced the message of Psalm 139. And I want to pair that message now with a second one from the Hebrew Bible. This one from the beginning of the story about Joseph in the book of Genesis, chapter 37, starting at verse 5. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. Later, Joseph came out to see these same brothers where they were tending animals and they saw him coming. So continuing now with verse 18, they saw him from a distance and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Americans are a bit obsessed with this topic of dreams. Especially during election campaigns, we are awash with references to something called the American dream. That term, the American dream, has the great advantage of being vague. Each person can fill in the blanks and say, yes, that's what I want. Usually it means something like finding what you really want your life to be about and then having the opportunity to pursue that. Well, what makes the dream American? This is a reference, I think, to the perception that in some other countries, you're told what your life must be about or what your limitations must be. In some countries, nationalism tells you to subsume your dream to the nation's purpose. In some countries, caste or class systems are rigid and tell you exactly what sort of dream you're allowed to have. So the American dream is about sufficient freedom to define yourself and sufficient opportunity to explore that and live it out. So are all dreams equal though? I was shocked once to hear a terrible misuse of the prodigal son story. The speaker was developing the theme that you have to have a dream. And he said, the prodigal son had a dream. Really? The prodigal son insulted his father, basically saying he wished his father was dead so he could get his inheritance and go spend it all in an orgy of self-indulgent behaviors and hedonism some dream. Surely we need to save the word dream for something more worthy than that. So if dreams are not all equally pleasing to God, then what about Joseph's dream? In the Joseph story, we eventually find out that Joseph's brothers misinterpreted the dream about the sheaves of wheat. It wasn't about Joseph ruling over them, as they supposed, an interpretation that would rightly be offensive. Instead, it was about Joseph rising to a place of influence where he could save his own family and many Egyptians from starvation. Hence the wheat in the dream. As Joseph lived his life, he showed integrity and promoted life for everyone, not just power for himself. Well, this is a characteristic of a worthy dream, a dream worthy of a person of faith in the God revealed in the Bible. It isn't just about get, getting what one wants for oneself. It's about somehow connecting who God created you uniquely to be to God's loving and joyful intentions for humankind. 
oh, this sounds very nice, but in fact, people who do this, who connect who God created us to be to God's real intentions for humankind, are often seen as a threat. In a wor world full of barriers erected for unworthy reasons, God's intentions can break those barriers in ways that many people just do not welcome. Love across social barriers is one of those disruptive ideas. The Romeo and Juliet story captures this well. The Montagues and the Capulets <clears throat> represent all the groups that draw lines that love is not supposed to disrupt. In the United States, marriage between whites and blacks was illegal for a long time. The Broadway musical South Pacific was ahead of its time in 1958, addressing this topic, but in an Asian context. There are two love stories in, in it that deal with racial barriers to love. One subplot is about a young soldier who's falling in love with an Asian woman on a Pacific island, and he's torn because he knows his family back in the States would not accept her. An older native on that island sings the song Happy Talk to him with these lines, you've got to have a dream. If you don't have a dream, how are you going to have a dream come true? So love across social barriers is a threat for many reasons, not just fears about intermarriage. Love leads us to see the worth in others. Love leads us to see them as Psalm 139 expresses it, as fearfully and wonderfully made by God, loved and pursued and known intimately by God who finds them worthy. And I think we all know what happens when we see someone that way. We want them to have all the same advantages that we have and more. Love leads to equality and justice. The speeches and the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. can't be reduced to one phrase, but his most famous speech is the I have a dream speech. He said that his dream was deeply rooted in the American dream. He always cast it, however, in terms that went well beyond any individual dreams of personal fulfillment. It was about a new sort of community among us and a recognition that our dream fulfillment depends to some extent on each other's freedom. It was a dream that was worthy of God's blessing. He believed it was in fact part of what God was doing, fulfilling biblical prophecy and and he even quoted the Bible again and again, including, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And finally, he articulated the very truth that made Joseph's dream about wheat not about being powerful, but about the fact that his destiny would save his family's destiny. Reverend King said, the marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. Our destinies indeed are tied together, and I, for one, am genuinely glad that our destinies are tied together, especially the destinies of black and white in America, but also the destinies of all the peoples of the earth. My delight at that idea is grounded in the feeling I have of being energized and completed when people share themselves and we find both differences and commonalities together. The blessings of participating in a local monthly dialogue of 
white and black pastors is just one of many such experiences that I've savored over a lifetime. I also accept that our destinies are intertwined because I would enjoy everything I have more if I knew everyone else was doing well by their own lights too. Those who get their vaccinations early rejoice, but will be happier when others they love get their vaccinations too. And we now know better than before that our health can't be secured without others securing theirs too. One's destiny indeed is tied to the destiny of others. This insight of Dr. King is profound and positive. And yet, he was killed. And that is often the fate of dreamers, and it nearly was the fate of Joseph at the hands of his brothers. In the community's Martin Luther King service today, we will hear a number of important messages, and one that particularly speaks to me is from the United Methodist Bishop Leonard Fairley. He meditates on the fact that the people who wanted King dead meant to kill his dream. The bishop repeats that dark statement made by Joseph's brothers, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. I can do no better than to echo and to ask you to listen to Bishop Fairley's conclusion. It is that we too can catch that dream and can carry it forward. When we let the unique selves God created, cre created us to be, connect to God's intentions for humankind, we will be led inexorably to participation in what is essentially a relay race. The baton was passed to Reverend King and it has been passed forward to other hands to be carried forward by other feet. Let's run the lap that God has given us to run fearlessly and well. Well, I don't know what prayer would be better to pray to follow that image of the relay race than the spiritual guide my feet. So will you please sing it as your prayer, our collective prayer now. Great. 